Thanks a lot, everyone, for inviting me. This is uh, also my first KXCon, so it's uh, quite interesting to see, and there's quite a few familiar faces in the room. And um, you know, it was interesting listening to some of the other talks today. I do hear a lot of the uh, same themes. Uh, so there will be a few bits that are a bit repetitive, but hopefully this is from a slightly different uh, angle. Uh, so what do I do for starters? So I run what we call the low latency electronic trading team at TD Securities. Uh, we focus on FIC products. So I think a lot of the other people that have uh, spoken today probably focus a little bit more on equities. Uh, so to that extent, we focus more on over-the-counter markets uh, where data is probably overall just dirtier. Uh, foreign ex so foreign exchange and government bonds are the two things we focus on quite significantly. Uh, so me, in terms of my background, I have PH, uh, PhD in applied physics. Uh, I started electronic trading back in 2008. Uh, and I remember shortly after I joined the desk, um, I got this thing called KDB. And I was looking at it and really not knowing what the heck to do with it. Uh, but the first thing I said to myself was, can I just download this data somewhere else <laughs> and stick it into MATLAB or whatever, right? Um, I was trying to do a very simple project there. And it was really just look at av the average spreads we were showing our clients. Uh, and so it was pretty interesting for me because uh, it was quite quickly that I kind of needed, to, I got thrown into the deep end there. Uh, you know, you can't copy it anywhere else, and so KDB was really the only tool to the job. Now, myself being kind of a physics background, that sort of stuff, not like a CS person, uh, the, and also not a math person, uh, the, the learning curve was rather steep, right? Uh, and so like what most people, I think, have this experience of, you know, you spin up KDB, and why the heck is everything a type error? Uh, and so it was, it was rather frustrating start, uh, but... Um, you know, after, in, in front, to that extent, I was just forced to use it because it was the only tool. Uh, over the years, I started to learn and really appreciate it, uh, the power of it, and the cleanliness of the language. It's just very concise, and it's, it's very well written. Uh, and so that was very interesting for me because while I was, uh, at the time, I was at Citigroup, uh, and it was interesting because uh, basically we just started using KDB for more and more things. Uh, a lot of things, you really didn't even need KDB to do them. They were relatively small data sets, but it was just much easier to have everything in one database. Uh, and then when you did, needed to do basic things like joins, uh, it was very elegant. Uh, so to that extent, you know, I, I grew to really uh, like KDB quite a bit. Uh, a couple of years ago, I went to the buy side, and then I joined TD Securities about three and a half years ago. Uh, and to my dismay, they did not have KDB. Uh, and so I kind of I felt like I went full circle because then I was basically forced to do a lot of the stuff that I was used to doing with KDB in Python. Uh, and very quickly, I kind of looked at things like pandas merge and said, why the heck does it have so many freaking options? Like if someone could explain to me why it has a right join and a left join, I'd love to hear it. Uh, and so it was very interesting for me because as I started developing our Python analytics libraries, I did this in a very thoughtful manner such that we could basically hopefully replace it with KDB at some point. Uh, and that's what we're in the process of doing now. And so I think it's been a really interesting journey for me going from not really liking KDB very, very much to really enjoying it and then to really missing it. Uh, and so for me, this also the other parallel I can kind of offer you is that there have been a number of people on my team that have left to uh, big tech. And the one thing that kind of comes back to them, I wish I had KDB. Uh, and so I think this is a really interesting one for me because I'm kind of, at TD on a bit of a mission here to take a lot of the people that we have in the organization that know Python uh, and slowly expose them to KDB uh, and get them hooked uh, basically like I did. Uh, so Python versus KDB, uh, why, why do we need them, right? Uh, so you know what's good about uh, KD, uh, Python in particular, the barrier to entry is incredibly low. Uh, it's very easy to set up, pretty intuitive to learn. Uh, and then one, one of the things I like about it is it's, uh, the barrier to entry is not too low like low-code solutions, right? Where it's a GUI and you can kind of link some stuff together and you don't need to program. For me, those are just liabilities. Uh, some of the things which you all probably know, uh, when it comes to plotting and visualization libraries, things like Plotly and Dash are incredible. Uh, they are kind of really industry leading. And at the end of the day, generally when you're doing any sort of statistics work, you need to present it to somebody. Uh, and if you've got good plotting libraries and they look nice, um, it's easier for you to use them. And when they look nice, there's one simple fact. Business management looks at things that look nice. Uh, and so it's a very effective way to get, get someone's attention. Uh, some of the other things that are really good about it, it's really easy to connect to just about anything. Uh, inevitably, you're going to have some of your data that's in KDB, like your tick data, for example. And there's always one data set that's not. 
Uh, and so uh, Python is really nice because you can really connect to just about anything under the sun and then leverage KDB for you know, more statistics and things that it's good at. Uh, furthermore, I think we all kind of know this, but the advanced statistical libraries, when you talk about, I'm kind of an old school guy, so I call AI and ML as just statistics to me, uh, but all of those great statistics libraries uh, that you get in Python. Uh, one of the things that I think is, is decent but not great uh, is the overall developer experience. So there I'm really talking about IDE, CI, CD pipelines, all that sort of stuff. It's not quite of the way to Java, uh, but it's pretty decent. Now, what don't I like it about it? Uh, one, is the barrier to entry too low? Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen, gotten a resume sent my direction, and it says, oh, this person can code, they wrote Python on their resume. <laughs> And, uh, and then the other thing for me is it's, it's very typically used as a scripting, uh, scripting language. And for me, scripting languages are liabilities because those are the scripts that there's only one person on the desk that can run it and God forbid they're sick that important day, uh, the whole thing breaks. Uh, the next main thing is I think there are a lot of people that know Python, but I really haven't met very many people that know Python very well. Uh, and so you get a lot of mediocre uh, code. And so for me, coming from KDB, uh, the fact that Python's not strongly typed uh, is absolutely horrible. And for me, this just scares the crap out of me uh, because it leads to, it can easily lead to what I call silent errors where effectively your code runs, but the output is garbage to some extent. Uh, and so that was one of the things I really didn't like. Now, obviously there's things like MyPy where you can get around it, but it's not easy. Uh, the next thing I'd say is, I can't say table objects are all that good. Um, if you look at something like pandas, it's, it's a little clunky around the edges. And if you look at something like numpy, it's a little bit hard to use, more performant though. Uh, probably the absolute worst thing about Python is I don't know if anybody has to manage their own virtual environment uh, and package dependencies. Uh, if you do, that's a royal pain in the butt. Um, the kind of issues you get with things like requests in URL lib3, uh, that kind of randomly break all of your code, uh, it just happens again and again. Not to mention the fact that if you're running a global team like I do, uh, you really need to make sure that everybody's running the same versions of code uh, uh, on their machines. Uh, so managing a virtual environment's not the easiest thing to do. If you're fortunate, you have a Docker. Uh, if you're like me and we don't have Docker approved yet at TD, uh, you're SOL. Uh, so you had to take a uh, deal with that. And then the next thing is, um, there's like 10 different ways to do pretty much everything in Python. And it feels like there's about a thousand different packages that do the same thing. So it can be very difficult from a coding point of view and there's many different ways to solve the same problem. Your code isn't consistent. If you're working with a global team of like quants and researchers, that consistent, the lack of consistency can become a real problem. Uh, so I think those are kind of the pros and cons. And if I you know, compare this to KDB, it's very different. So, you know, uh, KDB is super powerful and efficient. Generally, I'd say there's kind of one, more or less one way to do things. Uh, I very much like that just from a consistency point of view. Um, obviously, we all know this, but uh, KDB is the best performance for what I call serial big data problems, uh, which are the problems that most big data uh, solutions don't really cater for. I've got a very long series of data I need to do a big operation on, i.e. a time series database. Uh, other things great about it, type safe. Um, I think the single thing that stands out for me probably the most about KDB uh, are the joins. Uh, they're elegant and they're, uh, they're performant. Um, they're very intuitive in terms of the way they operate. Um, and so I think it's very easy once you know those to do something. And you know, when I picked up Python not having KDB, one of the first things I did was just write my own simple joins that basically mirrored KDB. Um, and, so, and then the other thing that I think uh, KDB is good at is I've seen a lot better GUIs for inspecting data in KDB uh, than I have in Python, uh, which is an interesting one because if you don't look at the data source, I can guarantee that uh, you've got a problem there. Uh, and so uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. Cons, I think everybody knows this, there's a high barrier to entry. You know, if, I think if you're a math person and you pick up Q for mortals, uh, you'll get really excited with the first chapter of the book. Um, however, if you're not, it can be quite intimidating. Uh, and then the other thing, which you know, I was really glad to hear some of the comments about VS Code, that's the IDE that uh, we use. Um, you know, the developer experience in KDB, I think, is, uh, historically has been lacking, right? You know, it's these things that you get out of the box with something like Java, auto doc strings, code completion, refactoring and usage. Um, and then the other things, you know, in order to make your, your code good, 
uh, you know, static code analysis, things like spell checking, uh, unit test with code coverage. Uh, so not just having unit tests, having a little line as well showing me, hey, this red line ha doesn't have a test for it. Uh, those sorts of things I think are really important uh, as well as you know, the CI CD pipelines are, aren't the best. Um, so that's kind of when I look at that. Now, I need to we need to really think about who are we talking about and who are all the people that are gonna be using what we're building. Uh, so first we've got kind of obviously KDV developers. You know, I'm not gonna talk, comment on that one much. Next, we really got what we call our data engineering team. And our data engineering team is typically responsible for creating data pipelines. Uh, we have data from a lot of different sources. It's very, very dirty. I think relative to the comments from, from you about at Virtue, you need somebody to clean up all that data, right? Uh, and you need these nice, easy to use uh, methods uh, for everybody else further down the stack. So uh, you know, below data engineering is usually our e-trading team as well as our quant team. Uh, uh, similarly, we have technology and support, usually looking at things like uh, performance. Uh, finally, uh, next we've got our e-sales team. So one of the things that we've really noticed is our sales team has become much more data-driven as we've exposed clean, intuitive, easy-to-use data to them. They really use that to optimize our business and make sure that you know, we're spending our dollars where we're actually generating revenue. Uh, finally, there's risk and compliance. Uh, and when you look at KDB, uh, it's a very steep curve, uh, and what we'll, you'll effectively notice there is KDB developers know a ton, data engineers know a little bit, maybe they develop some APIs and maybe some pipelines, and from there down, um, largely speaking, they're running a lot of canned stuff. Now maybe your e-trading and quants are capable of writing some scripts themselves, uh, but generally speaking, below that, they really don't know much KDB, nor should they need to. Now if we contrast this to Python, the KDB developers generally don't know that much Python. Uh, your data engineering people is usually where we find the, the most expertise there. Uh, and so those are the ones that are developing libraries and pipelines. Uh, E-trading and quants are often more creating uh, reports or GUIs uh, based off the data from the pipelines and the APIs. Uh, so the visualization part of that is really important. Uh, technology support and e-sales uh, is often more just using tools that other people have generated. Uh, maybe they're making a couple of changes here and there. Uh, and risk and compliance, you know, at the end of the day, for me, they're usually ticking a box. Uh, so that's basically who we're thinking about when we're thinking about the people that are going to be using our platforms. So what do we do with this kind of stuff? So data engineering, the number one thing is just really creating the data pipelines uh, that clean, normalize, and enrich the data. And so I've got, you know, a very simple kind of KDB diagram on the side. I'm sure there's all the components there you've all kind of known and seen. I think there's a lot of things that we've kind of talked about before. So I think relative to your talk, you know, the usage of uh, complex event processors and those working the same way as your historical and real-time data so that it's easy to have something running in real-time and then also make sure that it's historically correct. Uh, but then we generally have data pipelines that create some data, save it back to KDB. Uh, and then we slap on APIs on top of that uh, and then expose it through different visualization tools. Uh, and so one of the things we're really doing is creating the pipelines and then exposing the pipeline through clean, intuitive, and easy to use APIs. Uh, the e-trading quants typically take these APIs and, and do things with them. Uh, and so one kind of you know, relatively straightforward and simple example that, that resonates very well with our client base is looking at liquidity. Uh, so in this particular case, we're looking at spot liquidity over a period of, I think that's three or four years. <laughs> um, and so it's a very, pretty large set of data. Uh, and basically there, what we're really doing is just trying to quantify how liquid the market is and look at that, how that changes over time through stressed events like COVID or maybe the banking crisis recently. Uh, and this sort of stuff really helps us understand our trading strategies better so we can understand if today is less liquid than before, how much less liquid is it? Now to do this type of analysis, um, you really do need something like KDB just because the data set itself is so large. And so this is a, a little bit different problem than a lot of the stuff that we've seen today where it's not that complex of statistics here, right? You know, it's really just running, uh, you know, a bunch of averaging and that sort of stuff, maybe trimming some stuff here and there. Uh, but this isn't really AI and ML. This is more what I would call kind of the typical usage of KDB. Uh, but it is very powerful because there, are, you know, when I look at our client base, they don't have access to this amount of data. And they certainly don't have platforms like KDB to do this type of stuff. So this really does add quite a bit of value. And then the other thing that our e-training and quants do, they do a lot of as-of-joins 
to really optimize trade, trading and hedging strategies to kind of see in different liquidity conditions, different spreads, does one strategy perform better or worse? And so it's really an important part of the idea generation process where they're trying to identify a feature that maybe we need to account for this in our algorithm uh, and we haven't done so. And they'll often use uh, KDB data to do that. Uh, next, we've got uh, e-sales. Uh, the number one thing they're always looking for is client value. Uh, and so one of the things we build for them are pretty you know, intuitive uh, tools, and I try to kind of get them to learn effectively functional select without telling them, uh, or I kind of tell them, what are your conditions, <laughs> what are your group buys, and what are your aggregations, right? And so what you'll see here is it's a very intuitive thing for most people to use where they can kind of go in, and it's not all that complex, pick a date, add some filters to it, uh, decide how you want to group the data, and then look at what kind of measures you want to. So at TD, we have a very robust mo uh, uh, model for client value that kind of encompasses a whole array of different factors. And a lot of the data sets are actually coming from very different sources. Uh, and so this is one of the nice things about KDB as well, as we're able to connect to a uh, large number of data sources, uh, some of which are painful to connect to, uh, join the data, save that down via pipeline, and then that's what we expose to our Salesforce. Uh, and so they're really using this to really look at uh, client value and assess uh, what we're doing with things. Uh, next, we got technology and support. So typically, they do kind of some simple stuff, uh, time series quite a bit. This is a very simple just uh, look at the system latency and load uh, to just see what's going through. And kind of, again, we want to compare uh, the current day relative to other days. So this is just kind of a view of non-farm payrolls, right, to see what it looked like in terms of this was particular latency. Uh, and I think those are probably pretty common use, ca uh, use cases and patterns across those different types of end users. Uh, and so one practical use case, right, uh, that some of you, some, I'm sure a number of you have seen, uh, and so apologies if this is a little dull for you, but it is really at the core of a lot of the business decisions we make. So one of the things we often want to know, uh, especially in over-the-counter markets where you show different prices to different customers, you want to assess the toxicity of client flow. Uh, and so the very simple way you can do this is very simple to price impact, right? Um, and it is driven by those exact same factors. Uh, but basically, one of the things we do is we adjust our pricing and hedging strategies based on how toxic the flow is expected to be. Uh, the number one thing we look at to do this, it's very simple, what we call markout. Uh, and basically, we're comparing the traded rate uh, to the mid rate at various points in time. So the traded rate is the price zero there, and price T would be the midpoint at some point in time. Uh, at the end of the day, it's just an as of join with a bunch of times. Uh, and when you start to look at that, it's very interesting because you can kind of ascertain different, different things about different types of traders. Uh, and so here I've got a very simple example. Uh, where let's say we bought uh, at that orange little dot there. Uh, and let's say that's the dollar CAD rate. So obviously this wasn't a good trade because we bought and the market moves lower uh, as soon as the trade. Uh, and so if we kind of you know, change this into market terms, effectively we get a very similar chart like this where effectively we can see that when we got the trade on as a market maker at making money at you know, $50 a million, let's say, and within about a second or so, it's already trading at mid. And so to that extent, I've, I haven't gotten any value of that. Now, this is a very interesting one because prior to having this, this type of uh, information, maybe we've got a P&L that's attached to a trade. That's probably about it. If I just show a salesperson a number to say, hey, we're losing money on this client, they'll ask me why. If I can show them something like this and say, hey, it's already underwater a second after the trade, uh, they can't tell me, like, hedge faster and you can cover this flow, uh, which as a strategy generally doesn't work at all. Uh, and so to that extent, this is very important because this is a really key tool for us to remove uh, emotion from the decision-making process. Uh, generally, salespeople are motivated by volumes typically, and, and traders are the ones that are, you know, that we're stuck, you know, making sure that the P&L is good. And so when we can kind of show our salesperson two different types of flows, uh, one being a very friendly type of flow where after we trade, yeah, it moves against us a little bit because as a market maker, it always does. Um, you know, it still stays positive a decent amount of time versus somebody that's not. It just makes that decision a lot easier to make when we can point back to actual numbers to really remove uh, emotions from the decision-making process. And so these markets are really a key tool that in the FX market we've been using for over a decade, 
Uh, but it's very interesting because you start to see these same type of me these exact same measures coming into places like treasuries, government bonds, uh, that sort of stuff. It's not rocket science, uh, but you do need a decent amount of compute to usually calculate these. Uh, and they are very powerful tools to really optimize you know, the way you're pricing, the way you're hedging, or you, know, you could look at different signals, right? If I've got different alpha signals, what does the decay look like? Um, so this is kind of a practical use case of KDB um, that we use basically all the time. Um, so then you might ask the question like, well, why do we need KDB, or why do we need Python in the first place? The number one thing is there's a lot of signals that aren't in KDB. Uh, and so one very easy thing we can do is use Python to connect to a different data source, uh, pass that into KDB, do an as of join, let's say, in KDB, and pull that right back, right? And so to that extent, we're really leveraging KDB for the number crunching, right? Uh, and we can leverage Python as also almost more, uh, it's good at plumbing. And I don't know if you've, any of you have set up, I'm sure a lot of you have set up connections to different type of databases or data sources, the plumbing takes a ridiculous amount of time and the value add is incredibly low. Uh, that's where something like Python can be very handy for data sources that aren't naturally high ticking frequency, that, that sort of thing. So for example, we've got a, a process that we run every night that connects to our books and records system to get every trade the bank does. Uh, something like that, I don't necessarily need KDB for that. Right? Um, so, uh, so what do we need to do to, I think at the end of the day, one of the things I'd like to do is get my firm to use KDB more. Uh, and so the main, main way we do this is really by reducing the barrier to entry. Uh, and so first and foremost, uh, you know, I'm a very strong believer that all data is accessed via functions. Uh, and so I don't ever give anybody access to a table. And there's one fundamental reason behind that, and it's really that I want to, you know, whenever you do that, um, it's very difficult to reshape your data later if you'd like to. And I think a really good example of this that I still don't know the right answer to after working in FX since 2008, so a while, um, is I've got a swap. So a swap is buying something and selling something else. Is that two rows in a database or is that one row? Um, and then when you try to do simple things like count the number of trades, sum up the volume, uh, the aggregation isn't necessarily easy, right? Or you've got a very wide column that's more a table that's difficult to use. And so by you know, having people access via functions, you can change that structure if you want to in the future. And I think that's very important, uh, not to mention other things like the accuracy of the aggregations. So inherently, you've always got trades in your database that you need to exclude for certain, certain things. I think one great example that you see often in fixed income markets is if you look at requests for so the way the market trades based on requests for quotes. So the client requests a quote, uh, as a dealer, you send them back a price. Um, so one of the things you look at is, well, how much of those do I win, right? And now one thing you always want to exclude in that is cases where the dealer, the, the client, only, gave, only showed one dealer the, the price. Uh, because obviously you're not in competition there. And so that's a very simple one where I just want to exclude a little bit when I'm calculating this pretty basic measure. If I didn't do that via an API, the number of times someone would have got that wrong uh, is through the roof. Uh, and so it makes it quite a bit easier in terms of the accuracy of your aggregations. Uh, and so one of the things we really try to do is create a public facing API that are intuitive, easy to use, and concise. Uh, and so for me, generally speaking, I shouldn't need to look at the documentation of a function to know how to use it. It should be quite obvious if I've got positional inputs it should be very obvious what they are. In this particular case, it was get a price. So it seems kind of obvious that I need a start and an end, uh, as well as maybe an instrument, in this case, a tier. Uh, so those would be my required arguments. And then I'd have a bunch of other uh, optional arguments that I want to set for most of the users because I can guarantee most people make the same mistakes. Uh, and I think to kind of some of your points, right, um, you know, one of the things I, I always add on there is the ability to remove weekend data. I can't tell you how many times I've seen data over the weekend cause problems to quants, e-traders, uh, whoever. And so by having those kind of features under the hood, we can disable them when need be, but for general use case, uh, we can kind of give them the, the best thing and the, the most common pattern to use. Uh, and so to that extent, we use a few positional arguments and then we use dictionaries. And that's probably very consistent to the way most people write KDB code. I mean, it reminds me of one thing if I was kind of thinking about this, and it's the, uh, you know, the limits on the number of inputs to KDB. 
Uh, when I was younger, that, that definitely frustrated me. Uh, and now I can kind of see, like, if you've got a function that has more than eight inputs or nine inputs, like, the ease of mixing them up is incredibly high, right? And so I think that was an interesting one for me. That took a long time for me to really understand why that was done. Uh, but I think it highlights the thoughtfulness that's really gone behind KDB. Uh, and then finally, we always, uh, you know, enable the backdoor. And so this is what our Python API would look like. It's very simple to use, uh, very intuitive. And then what we do from a KDB point of view is it's really just a wrap around the KDB function. Uh, that's it. And the, the nice point here is usually that we get people used to using the API in Python. They're not even aware it's KDB under the hood. Uh, and then sooner or later, they need to do something a little fancier. Maybe it's a join, maybe it's something else, whatever. And that's really the road to get them interested in KDB and get them to start to know it. And that's really where what we want them to be able to do first is run a function, right? Uh, and then do some basic things to that. And so that's been a very effective way for uh, us to reduce some of the barriers to entry. So now kind of uh, switching gears a little bit. This is probably more of a gripe for me with Python. Uh, and when it comes to data science stuff, uh, garbage in, garbage out is, is one of the, me the most important things. And in order to do this, you need to look at the data. Um, generally speaking, people are lazy. Uh, and so if it's not easy to look at the data, uh, people are going to avoid doing it. If it's not easy to run a unit test, people won't run the unit tests. Uh, and so to that extent, you really do need to reduce the frictions. And I think it's interesting because if I just look at, you know, I use VS Code a lot. Um, and so if I kind of open up the Jupyter Notebooks type style in VS Code, uh, this is the table that I get out. And I can't even see the timestamps, right? And so what do I do? I copy and paste it to Excel. Uh, but it takes me a number of clicks to do that, and it's painful, right? And so whenever you see something like this, uh, it just really slows you down. So this was a good example for me when I joined TD and they didn't have KDB. Um, I was forced to do this kind of stuff, and kind of being an, an older KDB kind of person, uh, these frictions add up really quickly, and it just reminded me of in KDB, you know, the, these little things matter, right? So auto-fitting the column width, alternate row highlighting, responsive scrolling and sorting, uh, and then hotkeys for running li lines and sections. And I, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with a lot of the, the tools that were in KDB, but even when I think back to Studio for KDB Plus, uh, however many years ago, it was very easy to use. And so when I see Products like uh, Time Stored, uh, like QPad, Studio for KDB Plus, KDB Insights. Having a table that's easy to use is so important. Uh, and so that's kind of one of the things that I really stress is that tools like this we need. And now ideally, if they're integrated more so into something like VS Code, I think that's where things really start to get more powerful and we start to mimic the developer experience that you get in things like uh, Java. Uh, and so I think, you know, final thing I've got, just kind of my few, you know, two cents on uh, PyKX. Uh, so generally there's unlicensed and licensed versions, right? Uh, for probably 90% of our use cases, all we need is simple IPC, right? We're just kind of calling a function, returning it, doing some plotting in, in KDB. Uh, and so for us, this is really um, helpful because um, in most of the cases, our quant trading team is not running on a server. They're usually running stuff on their Windows box, right? Uh, and so to that extent, having a KDB license on every one of those is going to be cost prohibitive for me, especially if we've got a very large number of people across a lot of different assets, right? So to that extent, you know, uh, we really try to cater to the lowest common denominator. And so we really use the unlicensed version quite heavily. Now, the license side, I think there's a couple really interesting things. I think for me, the NumPy integration seems really powerful. Right? Just getting better ways to link up these advanced statistical libraries with things like KDB um, is kind of a no-brainer. Now, if I'm honest about it, how many AI and ML problems do I have relative to much simpler problems? For every, I don't know, 20 simple problems, I probably have one complex problem. Uh, and that's just kind of a fact of life. So to that extent, um, you know, if I've got a few people doing heavy-duty predictor combinations or something like that that's very intensive, uh, using a licensed version is going to make more sense. Uh, the other thing I quite like about the licensed version, I like unit tests. I like kind of code coverage. So for me, when I'm kind of playing around with the object types between Python and KDB, making sure that I understand exactly how they're going to interact um, is important. And that's where I like in the licensed version that the unit tests work with KDB objects. Uh, and the unlicensed version is just a pointer to a memory location. 
Uh, so I think with that, um, that was what I had to say for today.